Hello, my name is Troy Parfit, and today I want to talk to you about a book that I've written called The Devil and His Do, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler, to try and dispel rumors about it being badly written, some kind of hoax, a pack of lies, motivated by jealousy about Jordan Peterson's success, etc., and to show you how such claims come from Jordan Peterson's adherents and are meant to dissuade members of the public from reading the book and learning the truth, that Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, best-selling author and professor at the University of Toronto, is a neo-Nazi and the leader of a massive Hitlerite cult. You'll be glad to know that this talk won't contain too much self-pity. However, it will include what I hope to be useful information and enlightening asides. So, several months before the first volume of my book was published, yes, there are two volumes, I began talking about it online and posting images of the cover, and the claims that I just mentioned started appearing. The one that was most common, that was shared and taken up by others, seemingly in a state of panic, was, don't read this book, it's badly written. Again, this was months before the publication date. Peterson's followers, who are called lobsters, gathered inside their traps to sound the underwater alarm. Two of them told me they had contacted Dr. Peterson to inform him of my libelous attack on their guru's unblemished character and to let me know that I was nasty business. Bear in mind that the latest slogan in the Jordan Peterson movement is Hail Lobster, a take on Hail Hitler, created by Peterson's propaganda machine in order to refute Marvel Comics recasting the character of a Nazi supervillain named Red Skull in the likeness of Peterson. Many of Peterson's fans now use the Hail Lobster logo as seen in this photo, as their online avatars, and have been leaving comments under his videos like, Hail Lobster, I love this Nazi, and damn, I can't believe the Nazis finally resurrected Hitler himself. Of course, such remarks are meant as jokes. Do you see how they're funny? The Nazis were mass murderers. In Paris, they burned French citizens at the stake. At Auschwitz, they injected chloroform into children's hearts to cause heart failure. They shot Jewish women to death and then hacked off and bagged their breasts supposedly for scientific research. With that in mind, here's another remark from one of Peterson's comment sections. As a Jew, I have never agreed more with a Nazi or a lobster as I do with this great man. Peterson's lobsters are fond of jokes, but what they just don't get is that the joke is on them. The Hail Lobster logo may have been inspired by this image, which appeared on the cover of a brochure published by a group of disabled war veterans. They drew attention to hate-inciting literature from fascist organizations, which incidentally referred to themselves as patriotic organizations, and warned that America was susceptible to national socialist sabotage from within. Their pamphlet also said, We cannot reach the source of this filth, as we did in 1917, but the poison pumps that are busy in our own land must be plugged. The Hail Lobster logo appears on a Hail Lobster t-shirt, modeled by none other than Jordan Peterson's daughter, Michaela Peterson. As you can see, the logo and the t-shirt are black, white, and red, the same colors as the flag of the Third Reich. Now here's an excerpt from a U of T lecture in which Jordan Peterson is talking about Hitler's flag, along with Nazi propaganda posters. And the Nazi flag itself. Those are the three primary colors. Like if you look around at cultures worldwide, and you look at names for colors, every culture has a name for black, white, and red. Do you see how this information could be useful to students of psychology? Black, white, and red, that's fruit, day, and night, or it's blood, day, and night, or it's rage, day, and, or war, day, and night. So it's a powerful symbol. It's also a sun symbol. It's a Sanskrit symbol, but it's rotating backwards instead of forwards. So the Nazis were very aware in many ways of the meanings of the images that they were using. In some of these images, Hitler's more like the father of the people. In other images, he's more like the heroic Marduk, at the forefront of the march into battle, with the illuminated gods behind them. Ah, Hitler is like the father of the people, and the heroic god Marduk. This is interesting because Peterson has repeatedly characterized Hitler as godlike and heroic, for instance by saying he was God the Father, and boasting that he won a medal for heroism. Also of interest is how Peterson said, the Nazis were very aware of the meanings of the images they were using. I get the impression that the father of the lobsters, who identifies above all as an exploratory hero, is very aware of the meanings of the images he is using. For example, if you look at his maps of meaning symbol, which he designed, you should see, in the center, a swastika rotating backwards instead of forwards, and six colors, including black, white, and red. If you think I'm imagining things, I'm not. 
During a lecture that was aired on TV Ontario, Peterson showed the audience his map symbol saying, when I was making this thing, you know, I kind of wanted it to rotate a bit. Again, Peterson said the swastika was rotating backwards, and when designing his logo, he wanted the center portion, which looks like a bent swastika, to rotate. Oh, and here's a photo from the psychology class in which Peterson spoke about the Nazi flag. You can see an image of the flag above his hand, which is extended outward in a Nazi salute. In Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, he defines order as trains that leave on time and the flag of the nation. Can you guess which nation? I'll give you a clue. It's not Canada. Peterson has a personality lecture called Existentialism, Nazi Germany and the USSR, in which he barely touches on existentialism or the USSR. Instead, the first half of the class is dedicated to revering and empathizing with Adolf Hitler. Peterson calls Hitler's speech absolutely compelling and suggests that Hitler employed a magical language. In another lecture, Peterson claimed that ordinary Germans became Nazis because Hitler possessed black magic. In any event, the screenshot for the existentialism lecture was this rather flattering picture of Adolf Hitler. However, after Peterson shot to stardom by falsely claiming that Canada had compelled speech laws, he switched the image of Hitler for his Maps of Meaning logo, the one with the backward rotating swastika. During the aforementioned TV Ontario talk, Peterson told his audience that when they examined the center of the Maps of Meaning symbol, that it's a spiral, and then it's a tunnel. Just imagine a tunnel that's going back to a point, and it's fragmented into these four things here. Allow me to explain. The Maps of Meaning symbol represents the Third Reich. It was interchangeable with a photograph of Adolf Hitler. The spiral at its center is the previously mentioned bent swastika. When Peterson says it goes back to a point, he means a point in time, 1933. It's fragmented into four quadrants, like how Germany was divided into four occupy zones as a result of the Potsdam Conference, Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. In 12 Rules for Life, Peterson tells a joke about people being tortured in hell by Satan and low-ranking devils. Who are the people? Englishmen, Frenchmen, Americans, and Russians. And the joke's punchline has to do with genocide. Peterson is on a mission to reverse the spiral's motion so that it moves forward, and so the four quadrants are no longer fragmented, but united. Peterson has gushed and fist-pumped about the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall, not because these events meant that the citizens of the 15 former Soviet republics were no longer subject to communism, but because Germany was reunified, a prerequisite for what Peterson has referred to as the Fourth Reich. As you listen to the following quote, know that Peterson counsels against happiness, but when he discusses the Nazis or Germany, he becomes manic. Remember in 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell down? There was a great celebration in Berlin, and the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra played a part in it. And they came out to a section of the wall that had been knocked down. There was a huge crowd and played Beethoven's Ninth. I remember watching that, the great third movement, the triumphant third movement. Hitler, the great national movement, the triumphant march of our movement. He does a series of fist pumps and sways to and fro, playing those unbelievably remarkable notes in triumph that this horror show had finally come to a halt. Again, he means the horror show of Germany's partition had finally come to a halt. The spiral in the Maps of Meaning symbol could once again achieve forward movement. Furthermore, the horror show came to a halt because of Mikhail Gorbachev and his policies of perestroika and glasnost. When Peterson's daughter was born in 1992, he named her Michaela, after Mikhail Gorbachev. The Soviet Union, whose Red Army collected Hitler's charred remains as a kind of souvenir, had finally been defeated from within. Key to Jordan Peterson's beliefs is the concept of reversals. He has spoken about how you can manipulate language by taking it out of context, thereby reversing its meaning. Again, his Hail Lobster logo, promoted by Michaela, who criticized Black Lives Matter for infecting the media during an interview with the white supremacist Lauren Southern, is possibly a reversal of the octopus symbol used by American anti-fascists. While prophesying the demise of democracy, Peterson has warned that when things go too far in one direction, that is, toward liberalism, they come swinging back, or will reverse, quote-unquote, with a vengeance. Hitler likened the opinions of the working class to a pendulum that exists in an eternal sway. 
Carrying on, after Marvel Comics compared Peterson to a Nazi supervillain, he said, I've been called a Nazi before. It's not pleasant, but this is one step beyond that. He laughs. I mean, Nazi apparently isn't enough. I have to be a magical super Nazi. It's so surreal and absurd. Do you see the irony? Calling someone a magical super Nazi is surreal and absurd. Yet by saying that Hitler was godlike and spoke in a magical language, Peterson was effectively portraying him as a magical super Nazi or superhero. Also, being called a Nazi is not pleasant. Indeed, he has said that he'd like to slap or get physical with two people who compared him to a Nazi, one of whom was a woman. But if he calls people Nazis, that's fine. To be certain, he claims that one of his core beliefs is that, at heart, everybody is a Nazi. He has also said, in my classes, and I tell my students this right at the beginning, I'm trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis. So perhaps we can conclude that everyone is a Nazi, except for Jordan Peterson. Or maybe not, because Peterson has routinely identified as a Nazi. For instance, when he said that working as a guard at Auschwitz would have supplied him with happiness and left him feeling deeply satisfied. Put another way, oppressing, threatening, torturing, murdering, and sending innocent people to their deaths, men, women, and children, day in and day out, presumably for years, would have been Peterson's dream job. Unfortunately for him, he had to lower his standards and teach students, who he has characterized as stupid, that Hitler was akin to the god Marduk at the University of Toronto. He has stated that he could have enjoyed taking Jews off trains and working them to death, and he reminds his followers that they could enjoy it, present tense, too. Sure, he has also made statements denying that he's a Nazi. For example, because the political agenda I opposed was being driven by the people on the radical left, those are the people I've been taking to task, let's say. I didn't expect that the initial reaction would be, oh, you must be a Nazi. However, during an interview with Esquire magazine, he declared, I have something in common with Nazis, in that I am opposed to the radical left. And when you oppose the radical left, you end up being a part of a much larger group that includes Nazis in it. As Peterson has made clear, the radical left includes the Canadian government, who he claimed was corrupted by the Marxist element, or what Hitler called communist elements, that is, Jewish wire pullers, as well as educators for the crime of promoting social equality, and just about everybody who isn't an adoring member of his cult or who doesn't bat an eyelid when he admits he could murder Jews, raves about Nuremberg rallies, or calls Adolf Hitler God the Father. As for the much larger group that includes Nazis in it, which is opposed to the so-called radical left, that would be the alt-right and Jordan Peterson is its most esteemed member. If you provide Peterson's followers quotes of him admitting that he is united with the Nazis in opposing the liberals, they will tell you you're lying. He never said anything like that, and you know nothing about him. If you show them the source, they will accuse you of taking him out of context. If you ask them to provide the context, they won't be able to do it. If you show them multiple quotes of him, say, identifying as a genocide-minded maniac, they will tell you how refreshing it is that JP can be honest about his feelings, or that after he impressed upon them that they were Nazis, they finally began to understand themselves and the world started to make sense. After all, you never hear other public intellectuals admitting that they have what it takes to butcher Jews in a human slaughterhouse. What good are they? A search for the devil and his due yields reviews from Goodreads, eight reviews and an average of 1.5 stars. Here's what some of them say. Utter shit. Something between pig shit and horse dung. I wonder how the reviewer would know what those two types of feces combined was like. Lies and slandering, probably because of jealousy. Don't waste, W-A-I-S-T, money on this book. And my favorite, do you even have a brain with no question mark? If you go to Amazon.com, you'll find more of the same. 11 reviews, two admissions of not having read the book, and an average rating of two stars. One says, should have come with a tinfoil hat poorly written book with an Alex Jones level absurdity. This is intriguing because Peterson has defended Alex Jones when he said that Lauren Southern should not be deplatformed like Alex Jones was deplatformed. Lauren Southern and Alex Jones are white supremacists who float the white genocide conspiracy theory, and Jones played a role in fomenting the 2021 storming of the US Capitol. Another review called Complete Hatchet Job by a Lunatic says, I can find more patterns shared between this book and Hitler's work than the author can find between the two names mentioned in the subtitle. In other words, perhaps the one plagiarizing Hitler is me. 
This is a recurring theme. Peterson's followers have told me that I'm the Nazi. Peterson does something similar when he characterizes liberals as Nazis. He did this in the rise of Jordan Peterson when he implied that liberals were en route to creating another Holocaust, and in conversation with Douglas Murray when he said that liberals were the new Nazis. Douglas Murray is another esteemed member of the alt-right, who spends a lot of his time expressing exasperation about the presence of non-white people in Europe, and who insists that Tommy Robinson is not a Nazi, or even a racist. Peterson has also come to the rescue of Robinson, arguing that when the UK government imprisoned Robinson, they jeopardized his safety. Tommy Robinson is a white nationalist and a past member of the fascist British National Party. He is also the former head of the fascist British Defence League. At an anti-immigrant rally in Dresden, Germany, Robinson told a crowd of 40,000 people, do not let Germany be dragged back to chaos and destruction. All of your progress is now threatened. Your current chancellor, Angela Merkel, seems to be handing out the birthright of German citizens like she is handing out candy to children. Just to be clear, Peterson has criticized elementary school teachers who promote, and I quote, peace, empathy, tolerance, and human rights, and who make students aware of anti-Semitism. He's against teachers who talk about anti-Semitism, just like he's against Jewish members of the Frankfurt School who believe that the primary objective of education should be to create citizens who would not participate in another Holocaust. But when Tommy Robinson was jailed for the fourth time, in this case for contempt of court, Peterson tweeted that the decision was not a good omen. Educators who advocate tolerance, bad. Far-right thugs who promote racial hatred, good. Concerning Robinson's exhortation to not let Germany be dragged back to chaos and destruction, be aware that chaos and destruction were words that Hitler used in reference to the supposed character and intentions of the Jews. Jewish Bolshevik chaos would need to be replaced by a Nazi new order, and given that the Jews were so destructive that they wanted to kill all life on planet Earth, the Aryans should destroy them as a precaution. In 1939, Hitler said, I overcame chaos in Germany, I restored order. And in Maps of Meaning, Peterson writes, The Great Father is order, placed against chaos. The Great Father is the tyrant. We can speculate that the Great Father is the father of the people, that is, Adolf Hitler, in part because Peterson has referred to Hitler as the Great Father and the All-Seeing Great Father. Also, according to Peterson, Maps of Meaning is about the Holocaust. When Peterson writes about the need to transform chaos into order, and says, we can make order from chaos, what he means is, because he fancies himself a crypto-fascist, we can make Nazi order from racial chaos, or we can transform a racially contaminated society into a pure white society. How can we do that? By using the antidote to chaos, or what Hitler called an antidote for the poison. For Hitler, the words chaos and poison were synonyms that signified Jews. When Hitler wrote about the poisonous fangs of that power that transcends all state boundaries, he was referring to the Jews. And when he wrote, The fang with poison, chaos is what extends eternally, without limit, beyond the boundaries of all states, he was referring to the Jews. Actually, Hitler only made the first statement. The second statement was made by Peterson. However, Hitler really did complain about Germany's racial chaos and confusion, a bastardization and negrification. This was Germany's problem. But luckily, Hitler had the solution, which he wrote about in Zweite's book, or second book. Leading a nation from a deep and difficult illness is not a question of finding a prescription that is itself free from poison. Not seldom it involves destroying poison through an antidote. In retrospect, this can be seen as a reference to Zyklon B. When Peterson writes about an antidote to chaos, he's alluding to the anti-venom for the venomous Jews. It's a reference to Zyklon B, which he likes to talk about to his students in psychology class. Returning briefly to Tommy Robinson, before he embarked on his political career, he cut his teeth as a football hooligan who was reportedly adept at headbutting. Robinson is precisely the sort of guy who Peterson would admire and defend. He's one of JP's heroes, that is, far-right goons, who fights against the dragon of chaos, that is, non-whites. Across the devil and his dues negative reviews, there is, unsurprisingly, little to no mention of the evidence, because the reviewers didn't read the book. Which is another disturbing aspect of this story, evidence avoidance and evidence denial. People should be familiarizing themselves with the Jordan Peterson story, which is, if I do say so myself, fascinating if exceedingly disturbing, but most people won't. 
In the 1920s and 30s, people also ignored and denied evidence. In Mein Kampf, published across 1925 and 1926, Hitler said, if 12 or 15,000 of these Jews who were corrupting the nation had been forced to submit to poison gas, then the millions of sacrifices made at the front would not have been in vain. So we can see Hitler fantasizing about the Jews being gassed 16 years before he ensured that the Jews were gassed. By 1939, Mein Kampf had been published in 11 languages and sold 5.2 million copies. I wonder how many people who owned one noticed the allusion to gassing the Jews and thought about what it might portend. But then I wonder how many people who possessed a copy of My Struggle actually read it. Hitler said that had he known he was going to be made Chancellor, he would never have written the book. As it happened, he had nothing to worry about. People failed to heed its many warning signs. Even today, when people talk about Mein Kampf, what they tend to note is that it's badly written. Some sections are badly written, but that's beside the point. What does it say? Furthermore, reading Hitler's autobiography or manifesto is often considered taboo. It depends why you're reading it. If people were aware of the rhetorical stratagems that Hitler employed, Peterson might have been outed as a Nazi years ago. Become an individual. Stay away from the collectivist left. Exude personal strength. Take up and carry your burden, like Jesus carried the cross. Get organized. Become disciplined. Help yourself, then your family, and then your community. Make sacrifices. Avoid universities and their half-baked and effeminate theories. Remember, equality doesn't exist. Life is hard. We all suffer. The enemy is the left. I repeat, the enemy is the left. Democracy has had its day. I'm your father figure, and I'm here to save you. These are among the tawdry messages transmitted by Adolf Hitler and Jordan Peterson. But hey, people ignored Mein Kampf then, just as they ignore it now, during this resurgence of neo-Nazism. Ignoring evidence regarding a dangerous, fascist organization headed by a popular demagogue also occurred in connection with a book by Hermann Rauschning called Hitler Speaks, a series of political conversations with Adolf Hitler on his real aims. Rauschning was a German conservative and the president of the free city of Danzig. He briefly joined the Nazi party, but then annulled his membership in 1934 and left Germany in 1936 for America, where he denounced Nazism and published his book in 1939. As the subtitle suggests, it's based on meetings and chats that Rauschning had with Hitler and the notes he made after such consultations. Rauschning comes across as exceptionally observant, even prophetic. He reveals that Hitler modeled his movement after a religion or cult, that he had been influenced by mysticism and the occult, that he was itching for a war that he knew could cause widespread devastation in Germany, and Rauschning argues that Hitler was a rage-filled and egomaniacal lunatic who had transmitted his insanity to others like a virus. Hitler Speaks was meant to be a public warning, but Rauschning was denounced as a fraud whose dialogues were invented. What evidence was there to support this view? To my knowledge, none. How much evidence is there to suggest he was telling the truth? Some 289 pages. Examples of Hitler's speech, including word choice, topic, register, etc., are highly similar to examples in Hitler's Table Talk, Hitler's Second Book, and Hitler's speeches from 1939 to 1945, which were produced and made available after Rauschning published Hitler Speaks. Even Hitler admitted that half of Hitler Speaks was accurate, remarkable given that it depicts him as a monster. Perhaps by 1939, Rauschning's warning came too late, but if his book had been taken seriously, it could have proved an invaluable source to Western intelligence agencies and the general public. But then, as Gustave Le Bon wrote in The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind, the masses have never thirsted after truth. They turn aside from evidence that is not to their taste, preferring to deify error, if error should seduce them. Whoever can supply them with illusions is easily their master. Whoever attempts to destroy their illusions is always their victim. The Devil and His Due is not badly written. It is at worst competently written, and at best well written. True, it is not the type of book that calls for literary pyrotechnics. It's not a novel or an advanced polemical tract. Instead, it reads a little bit like a whodunit. Spoiler alert, it was Peterson in his upstairs office, or Eagle's Nest. Ever wondered why he has eagles painted all over his walls? With books by and about Hitler on his desk, so that passages could be plagiarized. One of those books was Rauschning's Hitler Speaks. Jordan Peterson told Dave Rubin that when he writes, he acts like a thief and imagines himself to be surrounded by barbed wire. 
Hitler began writing Mein Kampf in Landsberg Prison, surrounded by barbed wire. When a bookstore in New Zealand removed from its shelves 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, Peterson observed how the retailer continued to sell Mein Kampf, that his book was banned, and the book that supplied many of its ideas was not, must have provided him with a sense of happiness and left him feeling deeply satisfied. The Devil and His Due is not some kind of hoax. On the contrary, it exposes a hoax, perpetrated by Peterson on just about everybody. It reveals how he is not really a self-help guru, but a self-harm guru. It illustrates how he is not, as he claims, warning about neo-Nazism and trying to prevent another holocaust, but rather promoting neo-Nazism with the aim of creating another holocaust. The wheels fell off Peterson's tricycle long ago. He is completely insane. The Devil in His Due is not a pack of lies. Instead, it reveals how nearly everything Jordan Peterson says is a lie. The Devil and His Due is not motivated by jealousy about Peterson's success. Peterson is a Nazi and therefore an abject failure. However, he has been successful at getting people to believe that he is a force for good, when really he has dedicated his life to the pursuit of evil. Before he identified as a self-help guru, he identified as an expert on evil, which he said he had studied pretty much his whole life. In Maps of Meaning, which, remember, is supposedly about the Holocaust, he quotes John Milton's Satan to say, Evil, be thou my good. This is Peterson's core belief. It is why he says the sign on the gate at Auschwitz that read, Work will make you free, was a little joke. It is why he urges his listeners to view Hitler as a genius who must not be blamed for the war or the genocide. It is why he said Hitler burned the Jews beautifully and that the Nazis were unbelievably great at burning the Jews. It is why he talks about the valuable lessons he learned from the occult. It is why he praises and defends mass murderers like the Columbine killers, Karl Panzram and Paul Bernardo, all of whom murdered children. And it is why he has said, I can understand Nazis, and the reason for that is because I can see that as an aspect of myself, truly. I don't know what or how much you know about Jordan Peterson, but I can practically guarantee, sorry to say, that he is not who you think he is. His stated aims and beliefs are merely part of his public persona, an extension of his false self. He has an expansive, latent belief system, hidden from the public. This system is sophisticated and horrifying. To understand it, and, as Rauschning might say, Peterson's real aims, I would kindly ask that you set aside your preconceptions, be open to the possibility that what I'm telling you is true, and read the Jordan Peterson story. If you would like an overview of that story, a 57-page document called Jordan Peterson and Neo-Nazism, What You Need to Know, you can email me at t-e-p-a-r-f-i-t-t -T at gmail.com. In the subject line, please include the phrase Jordan Peterson and Neo-Nazism. Thank you and bye for now.